It's tough to resist the pleading eyes of a pet shop puppy. They're so cute, but what you don't see at the pet shop are the squalid places where these dogs are born and the cruel conditions under which they're raised. This is Kansas. 80% of the puppies sold in pet shops come from Kansas and six other states in the Midwest. Just as farmers breed chickens, pigs, and cows out here, so they breed puppies on what are called puppy mills. There are thousands of puppy mills hidden behind the barns and farmhouses here. It's a big money business. In one year, dog breeders in Kansas alone will make close to $30 million from selling puppies. During the course of our investigation, we visited a number of puppy mills. The dogs we saw were living in filthy and disgusting conditions. The female breeding dogs and the puppies are housed in everything from dilapidated chicken coops to rusty old refrigerators. The cages are overcrowded and provide no protection from rain and snowstorms. And obviously, the dog runs in cages are seldom cleaned. Excrement is everywhere. The dogs themselves were caked with it, and we saw feces in the food and water bowls. And the breeders don't seem to be too concerned about that. Well, you have to clean every two weeks underneath. Well, I guess you don't always get a chance to do that. No, I don't get that done that often. As for veterinary care, there isn't any. Too expensive, say the puppy mill owners, so without any training, they do it themselves. I was at one breeder where he picked up uh, a needle off his workshop and he gave uh, a shot to 10 different puppies using the same needle and he put the needle back down on his workbench as if he was going to use it again on some more puppies. Remember, these are the same purebred dogs that are sold in pet shops around the country for hundreds of dollars. It's no wonder veterinarians say their files are bulging with complaints about sick puppies bought in pet shops. We see horrible communicable disease problems within uh, almost all the puppies that you see from pet stores to various degrees from from nothing too serious to very very serious and even critical problems as for the breeding dogs they live their entire lives in these wretched conditions until they literally outlive their usefulness after these female breeding dogs can no longer deliver their two litters of puppies a year to the farmer, which is after they get to be about five years old, that's when they're usually killed. And with us, it's just a, kind of a waste then if you're buy, to buy feed for them if they're not going to produce. So right. it's just like hot cows. When they get too old, you don't keep them anymore. There is a federal law, the Animal Welfare Act, that's supposed to prevent conditions like these. But the agency that's supposed to enforce it, the Agriculture Department, says it just doesn't have the money or manpower to regularly inspect the puppy mills. And we've learned that because of budget cuts, there are no inspections of puppy mills scheduled for next year. I think we can fully expect that things will get uh, much worse if it's just human nature that uh, if you don't have someone looking over your shoulder, uh, regardless of what the law says, you, on your own, very seldom uh, comply with the, the law. Now, if the Animal Welfare Act is not going to be enforced, the Humane Society and veterinarians say there's only one thing to do with puppy mills. Quite frankly, uh, I feel that, that they all ought to be categorically shut down. But if the puppy mills that supply the pet shops with dogs were shut down, where would people go to buy a dog? Well, how about animal shelters, where seven million dogs a year are destroyed because no one wants them? Or pick up your local paper, and you'll see ads from local breeders who sell privately. Their purebred puppies are usually no more expensive than in a pet shop. And you can see the conditions of the kennels, and most important, you can see the parents of the puppy you're buying. That's not possible at a pet shop, where it's truly a case of puppy buyer beware. Buying a, a, a puppy from a pet store is, is really playing roulette. Uh, if you are lucky enough to, to happen into the proper puppy, great, you know, bless you. Mm -hmm. However, uh, your chances of doing that are rather remote. Now, obviously, not all dogs from pet shops are unhealthy, just as not all Midwest dog breeders have filthy kennels. But experts do agree that wherever you buy your puppy from, make sure you get a guarantee that you can return it if it turns out to be sick. I'm Arnold Diaz for CBS News in New York.
this year, about a half million people will buy a dog from a pet store. It's easy to understand why if you've ever passed a store window filled with those adorable little puppies. But that cute little doggy in the window may have just come through a nightmarish journey, a journey a thousand miles across the country, which has left it diseased and dying. So beware, that cuddly little puppy may very well turn out to be more than just a bad buy. It may break your heart. You see a doggy? I like this. <laughs> I just wanted to make my wife happy. I found the dog. Oh, this is the dog. Uh, she's going to love him, and that was it. And uh, little did I know that instead of bringing something nice and happy home, I was bringing Tara home. Within three weeks, Jim and Rose Cooper's dog was dead. Jim went back here to the pooch salon where he had paid $450 for the puppy. After some argument, he said, the store gave him another dog. The second one was healthy for the first two days. All of a sudden, boom, he got the diary again, and I says, oh, my God. I says to Jim, starting again, Jim. And I bring him to the veterinarian, and uh, within a matter of uh, the next eight or ten hours, the dog, he died. Back to the pooch salon and a third dog. They named it Titus. Titus was fine. He was a healthy dog. We had him close to a year and a half, but he was deaf. We wish that everybody buying an animal would ask where it came from, how it was bred, under what conditions, what age it was shipped at, how long it's been there, and how well has it. John Hoyt is the president of the Humane Society of the United States, and he says most buyers don't ask those questions. If they did, they would learn about puppy mills, breeding operations stocked with cages of dogs who do nothing but produce puppies. Why do you suppose that so many of these puppies are sick when they reach the pet stores? Well, first of all, there's a lot of genetic defects that come from the breeding of these animals. There are parasites, there are all kinds of diseases that they get uh, from the conditions, just the filth and, and the, the cold and the dampness under which they're bred and they're raised. In the state of Missouri alone, where we took these pictures, puppy breeding is a $50 million a year business. There are 5,000 puppy mills in the Midwest, operating with very little regulation or government supervision. The Humane Society, however, has its own investigators. Staff members like Lisa Landris go undercover to provide a rare look at what can go on. We see feces and excrement piled up all over the place. You see overcrowding. You see animals living on wire floors. Puppies sometimes fall through the wire and end up freezing to death because they can't get out of the cold. The majority of puppy millers feel that if three out of a litter of five survive, they're doing good. That's a high mortality rate, and they think that that's good. But the real tragedy are the breed stock that live in concentration camp-like conditions within these puppy mills. And they're stuck there for five or six years, however long they are productive. And the reward at the end of that five or six years is that they're killed. The owners are getting away with murder. And I mean literally murder, because they are consigning a lot of animals to, to death. But they're operating within the law. They're operating within the law as far as the law is uh, paying attention to what they're doing. By law, puppy mills must be inspected and licensed each year by the Department of Agriculture. The problem is, even though inspections can be frequent, they rarely put chronic violators out of business. Dr. Joan Arnaldi heads the USDA's enforcement effort. Isn't it incumbent upon the USDA to inspect and keep standards as high as possible? No, we can't extend our authority beyond what's given to us. Isn't that a cop-out? I don't think so. Even if the puppies make it through their first eight weeks of life, their problems are just beginning. To get to a pet store, there's a long trip ahead that can take them halfway across America and leave them diseased or dead. To find out how this happens, we secretly followed a shipment, something even the USDA has never done. It began one Tuesday at 9 a.m. in Missouri with breeders bringing the puppies to market. Brokers pay about $100 a piece for them. This is likely to be the first time the pups are away from their mothers. They're at the most susceptible age to get sick. Dr. Gordon Robinson 
head vet for the ASPCA, blames the shipment of dogs to market for much of the sickness. And a lot of that has to do with the stress, the way they were shuttled around and diets changed and different size cages, different uh, putting in with different animals. After leaving the broker, they travel through the back roads of Missouri into Iowa, where they're warehoused till dark in a huge kennel. At night, they're loaded into another truck with 40 more dogs. It heads north. The shipment grows again, this time in a roadside parking lot where another truckload of dogs and cats are combined with them. If one of these animals is diseased, there's no telling how many others it will infect. Now it's on to Illinois and the airport in Chicago. It's 2.30 in the morning, and the puppies must wait here another five hours for flights to take them to stores around the country. There they will be bathed and presented as healthy, happy puppies. Do you stop trucks to find out whether or not the conditions are proper? No. Do you inspect every shipment at the airport? No, no. We randomly do that. So what you're saying is that if they get diseases passed around to them during the shipments, so be it. There's no way to handle that because you have diseases incubating, so to speak, and you don't necessarily, are not able to even know that they exist at that point. Can we go inside and see? We have there have been three studies done, one in California, one in Kansas, and one in Atlanta, that found that half of all the pet store dogs examined had parasites or other illnesses. I do not believe that the studies clearly demonstrate that the majority of these puppies come anywhere near to being as sick as these people are alleging. Marshall Myers is both lawyer and lobbyist for the pet stores and for the breeders. To sit there and to castigate all pet store puppies as being sick compared to the general population. It's not a grand sweep. It's very simply that there are a lot of puppies out there that are arriving at pet stores sick. Well, we, we dispute that they're arriving at, at pet stores sick. Do you think that pet stores are the best place to buy a puppy? I think pet stores, for many people, that it can be a very appropriate place. Appropriate, but not best? To, that's a qualitative, judgmental statement as to what is best. But, I mean, are pet stores a good place to get a puppy? Anyone that is to, uh, desires to buy a puppy should check out the facility that they're going to, irrespective of it's being a pound, a pet shop, or a breeder. Checking out a facility can be difficult, even if a business calls itself a kennel or a breeder. We went along when New York City officers inspected the pooch salon. Its owner claims she breeds all the dogs she sells. The pups, they give to you? You purchase them to uh, no, 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 sell I them? No, breed them. We breed them. These are show dogs. So if you want to take, take a look at the pictures up front. They say they breed them. But using the receipts that came with the Cooper's three dogs, we traced all the dogs to the Midwest. Titus came from this Kansas puppy mill. According to the USDA's own records, which we obtained under the Freedom of Information Act, the facility had an alarming number of violations. A number of dogs were unhealthy. One had a serious ear infection. Inspectors also found manure and waste accumulating, food caked in the feed pans, and dogs without access to water. During one inspection, they even found a dead dog. With all that, the USDA did not revoke the breeder's operating license. The Humane Society says that the USDA just isn't tough enough on these breeders, that you let things slide. Well, we do try an educational process first. I think that's fair to people who are in a business, that you try to educate them as to how they can do a better job. But we do take strong enforcement measures when that becomes necessary. In this case, they chose education over enforcement. But while the USDA was educating the breeder, the Cooper's dog was born, bred, and shipped to New York City. Only then did a vet discover the dog was deaf. The breeder refused our request for an interview. Why do people buy pets from pet stores? I think people, unfortunately, are impulse buyers. Uh, pets, um, cars, a lot of other things. Uh, the, these animals are marketed in such a way that if you're walking through a mall or down the street, you see the puppy in the window. You get attracted to it. You get drawn to it. That's exactly what it was, impulse. <laughs> impulse. It was Christmas and her birthday at the same time. I figured, well, why not? Let me surprise her. And I went along and I went and purchased the dog. That unfortunate purchase, investigator Lisa Landris believes, is just waiting to happen again and again. The consumer mentality is that if I go to a pet store and I spend 
500 or 600 dollars for a puppy i must be getting something of very high quality in reality people are not getting another lassie they're not getting another rin tin tin overall we believe that the majority of the puppies coming out of the pet stores are good quality companion pets do you think that people have proper recourse against a pet store if they've received an unhealthy dog what we need to do is to have a good standard on the ability to return the pet, be entitled to a refund under certain circumstances, and for reasonable veterinary fees. But who wants to trade in a pet that they've come to love? Who wants to trade in? They're not toasters. They're not refrigerators. So what good is a guarantee if all the guarantee says, bring the animal back. If it's not well, we'll give you another one. I don't want another one. I want the one that's become a part of my life. A final note, Kansas, the nation's largest puppy producer, has just passed a law that in part makes it a felony to enter an animal facility and take photographs. Supporters of the new Kansas law say it's meant to protect farmers and ranchers from attacks by militant animal rights groups. But the Humane Society says that law takes away its power to investigate and document cruelty to animals. We'll be back in a moment. County, a dog and cat fight over the population explosion. The apparent choice between extremes, mandatory birth control or mandatory death. John Blackstone reports. Dog breeders showed up by the busload today to argue against the unprecedented proposal to make the breeding of cats and dogs illegal in this California county. Ex the local Humane Society proposed the ban to fight an ever-growing population of unwanted pets. Any dummy can turn any two dogs loose together and get lots of puppies. This is a real problem. This is not a manufactured problem and one that resonates really and truly all across the United States. We care for animals and then we turn around and we kill them. It's a problem all across the country, but it received dramatic attention here when the Humane Society staged a public execution of a frightened young pup. Local camera crews and photographers were invited to witness what is business as usual here. At this shelter alone, 10,000 animals are put to death every year. Nationally, seven and a half million cats and dogs are destroyed annually because nobody wants them. The general comments I'm receiving from the public is it's about time somebody came forward and showed the grisly work that's going on at humane societies. It's about time the public was shown the death that's going on at shelters, the death that's preventable. Those in the cages with the pink tags are next. The Humane Society says the only way to stop the killing is to stop the breeding. Under the proposed law, pet owners whose animals reproduced could be fined $500. All cats and dogs brought into the county would have to be spayed or neutered. But for dog breeders across the country, the proposal is more horrifying than a mutt straying into the show ring. They say the Humane Society's blatant appeal to emotions to promote the ban has done a disservice to all who love animals. I thought it was dirty, very dirty. Euthanizing a dog on the TV, I was offended, truly offended. Breeders say the ban would punish responsible pet owners but do little to cure the overpopulation problem. If uh, breeding dogs is outlawed, then only outlaws will breed dogs. And the breeders also point out they have many friends in high places. But for those in the Humane Society, that is part of the contradiction. In a nation of animal lovers, how can so many animals go unloved? John Blackstone, CBS News, San Mateo, California. And that's the news from our world tonight. Dan Rather for the CBS Evening News. See you tomorrow. Good night. It's 18 minutes after the hour. Puppies seem to bring out the most tender feelings in all of us. Well, almost all of us. There's a certain breed of breeder. To him, pups mean money. But as Wendy Takuda of KPIX-TV reports to the puppies, he means misery. It is an industry hidden away in the lonely farmyards of Missouri, Kansas, Arkansas. <laughs> Puppy mills, cage after cage of dogs, whose only reason for living is to breed. They're overcrowded, 
they're filthy, they're shivering from the cold, or they're baking from the hot sun, they don't have proper food and water, they're sick. For 10 years, investigator Bob Baker has tried to stop the abuse. It hasn't worked. With a hidden camera, we follow him to one farm. Inside a trailer, he finds a dead dog, several more living in pens covered wall to wall with their own excrement. This dog sits in his bowl to escape it. We are kicked off the property, threatened, but Bob Baker returns later on with the sheriff's deputy. By then, the dogs are gone. Did you see more dogs out here today? Oh, absolutely. How many dogs did you there see There is then? at least five. No one has been able to stop the owner, not the law, not the Humane Society. Bob Baker says the same man left behind five dead dogs and a scandal in Arkansas. But he's still listed as having a USDA license to raise dogs. The deputy promises to pursue the case. Bob Baker is never sure. The anti-cruelty statutes are very weak in, in these states where most of these puppy mills exist, and the law enforcement is very lax. In, in fact, uh, many, one of the worst places I ever saw was owned by a sheriff. Oh, yeah. He's over At another puppy farm, Clarence Still says he'll talk with us, but he won't let us take pictures inside. Clarence says bad publicity is hurting a lot of good breeders. Well, they're just trying to put us out of business, what they're trying to do. The Humane Society. Yep. The Humane Society wants new regulations to make the cages larger. The breeders are fighting it. Well, there are just some big shots up there, and if their wife got a little dog, and she takes it out and walks it. They're wanting these here walked every day if they get by, past what they're trying to get past. Wouldn't a man have time walking 150 dogs a day? But many say the USDA can't even enforce the laws it has now. This kennel is licensed, approved and inspected by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Excrement piled up under the cages. We decided to buy a dog to find out what kind of shape they're in. This dog came from a puppy mill in Missouri, where she probably spent her whole life in a cage. Her breeder called her number 15, but her papers say her name is Mary Ann. Well, she's thin. We took Mary Ann to an animal shelter in Kansas that rehabilitates dogs from puppy mills. Veterinarian Eva Dudek has seen a lot of dogs like her. Her skin is dry, cracking, red, and, and bleeding in some spots. Boy. I can imagine how uncomfortable she is. Marianne's nails are overgrown. She has an ear infection. Ear, it's been like that so long that her ear canal has so inflamed, there's hardly a hole in there. In spite of her condition, Marianne has been bred okay. and so just had a litter of puppies. She is starving herself to produce milk for the puppies. Marianne will be treated and put up for adoption, but she leaves behind hundreds thousands of other dogs that are breeding and often passing on diseases and genetic defects. Hip dysplasia. We see um, kneecaps that dislocate. We see um, eyelashes growing towards the eyeballs. We want states like Kansas, where we are right now. We want states like Missouri and, and, and Nebraska and Iowa and Arkansas and Oklahoma to clean up their act. Our rotoin consumers do not buy dogs to come from these states. This is Wendy Takuda for CBS This Morning. As a postscript, there's some good news for Marianne, the dog you just saw. She's been adopted by a family in the San Francisco Bay Area. And good news for puppy lovers and animal lovers in general. Kansas has vowed to crack down on the puppy mills. They're investigating 30 of them right now, closed down two so far. 23 after the hour.